ES Audio. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. Support with pride. Hello, I'm Lawrence Delalio. Welcome to the Evening Standard Rugby Podcast, supported by Fuller's London Pride. As ever, I'm joined by, well, the real presenter, really, and my co-host, the lovely Sarah Elgin. Sarah, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Law. Good, thanks. Um, yeah, we have another jam-packed episode of rugby news and reviews for you uh, this week. Also with us, of course, is Steve Cording from the Evening Standard. Hey, Steve. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Lawrence. How are you both? Good. Um, And we're delighted to welcome our special guest this week. It's Northampton Saints Scrum Half, Alex Mitchell. Hi, Alex. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. Delighted to hear on. Although I'm not sure how you and Lol are going to be getting on, actually, after this weekend's final Game, Game's minutes. over. Game's over. They took the point. <laughs> you know, that's the way it works. Congratulations. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the details of uh, your win, Alex. And um, we'll also um, be talking about the ongoing uncertainties of what's financial situations. I know Lawrence wants to say a few words about that. Um, but just on the game, Alex, what was the main feeling in, in, in the changing room after that dramatic finish? Yeah, it was a weird one. Obviously, it was a bonkers finish. We were happy about the five points, but we were quite frustrated with our performance because we thought our performance was way below par. I think the mistakes we left out there and, and the amount of points we could have scored um, was quite frustrating. So, yeah, it was a weird game, but I mean, to be involved with a game with a finish like that is is awesome and it was, yeah, a class finish. Yeah, and you got a day off today, I take it. What does a day off for Alex Mitchell look like? We're just chilling today. I've had breakfast with the lads this morning, a bit of a debrief about the game and then I'll go across to Virgin Active and then just do a bit of admin, maybe play a bit of FIFA with the lads as well. So yeah, pretty chill. <laughs> nice. Um, Steve, you've got some good news I hear. Did your football team actually win a game? We actually won a game. We Get won 4-0. In. Alex, you don't know, with my, my boys under 12, they've taken a tonking the last two weeks, 9-1 <laughs> and 9-0. And um, we were a bit worried about the future, but we actually won. Oh, oh, nice. Turned it around. around. Didn't concede a goal. The key is defence, you see. It's all about the defence. Does <laughs> that so, I mean you'll keep your job as a manager? Yeah, until next week, oh, probably. Brilliant. Yeah. Everyone's happy then. Uh, Lawrence Delalio, what have you been up to? I went down to Bristol to watch Bristol Chiefs and then... Uh, Took my son out, who's 21 next week, Enzo, for uh, for food, obviously, because he's got... For f- Sorry, wait, can we stop there? For food? For, well, I know he's a student, but students don't normally eat. Well, not when I was a student. Beans on toast. And, 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 Lawrence, you were like, I said, oh, good weekend. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Going to train my son and the boys, and uh, we're going to go out for a few beers. Oh, you're going to go out, are you, on Saturday night? Oh, no, no, we're going to go out no, for no, a few beers tonight. Very- very professional because I was working on TV obviously the next day but but I I, I coached his university side the Bristol University uh, rugby team um I say I did I brought Alex King down because he's actually <laughs> he actually knows what he's doing on the on the training field and he took the boys uh, which was fascinating actually just to, to watch a, a coach um who's clearly uh, been working with players you know up until a few months ago uh, and they really enjoyed it actually I mean I obviously did some scrums and line outs and malls which is pretty basic really isn't it it's just you know but yeah that was a uh, that was a nice little moment to do that I didn't think I'd ever be coaching a team with my son that's for sure is that something actually that you ever thought of doing um, I thought you've I think, been a pretty good coach I can see you in that role I think it's one of those things that uh, the decision for me was that if I got myself involved in coaching I think I'd probably be even more obsessed than I was as a player and I'm not sure that's a good thing for me or the people, <laughs> or the people around me so I wanted to have a bit of a rest from it. And I think since then, you never say never. I mean, there are you look at some teams and the way that they're, they're playing and the way they're coached, and you do think you probably could add a bit of value. So I'll start with Bristol University and see where it takes me. Okay, <laughs> okay sounds good. Okay. Tara, what about you? Come on, what about you? You've been three days in a row on TV. You mustn't have had someone to do anything else. I know I put in the graph this weekend. Yeah, she, yeah, graph she was voted weekend. the best female you know, presenter in rugby on the television. I mean... Uh, That's not strictly true, but we'll, we'll take it. <laughs> we voted that on our WhatsApp group anyway, so... <laughs> You're all biased, though. Well, <laughs> was, the, was the green coat deliberate? Because you had Brian on. Oh, it wrong? wasn't, actually. Yeah, Brian, did, Brian was on all weekend with us, wasn't he? Apart from... He was. I think he, Brian borrowed my son's jacket, didn't he? He was like a little Harrington bomber jacket. He thought, <laughs> he, was, he, thought he was 21 again. <laughs> right, enough fashion chat. Uh, we're going to get into some depth of analysis of the weekend uh, and results shortly, but let's put some questions to Alex now. <laughs> Don't forget, you can also watch the full extended video podcast at londonpridebeer.co.uk. Please drink responsibly. 
Alex, it is wonderful to have you on. And what we try and do is just get a bit of an understanding for our listeners as to your sort of your journey, really, your history. Um, I mean, obviously, you joined Saints Academy in, in 2015, but was rugby always something that you were, you know, were you watching it as a young kid growing up? Were you inspired to play or were you looking at other sports and rugby just came along? I think so. For me, when I was younger, I always played all sports, quite a sporty family, two older brothers. I mainly looked at football to start off with until I was about 12, 13, loved football, played a bit of rugby on Sundays. And then I think when I was about 12, 13, I had to make a decision. And my dad's a big rugby fan. He was like, look, I'm going to put you down the rugby route. Uh, I think it'd be quite tough to make it in the football life nowadays. And then just went from there. And then obviously kept on playing, did quite well, came through the Sail Sharks Academy. And then when I was about 17, 18, had to make a decision of, of who I wanted to join. And it was funny because my brother was also a scrum off at Sail Sharks. I didn't really want to be stuck behind him and try to argue. I'd be argue with him anyway. So imagine if we were trying to fight for the same nine shirt. So I was like, oh, not for me. I was wondering why you moved from Sail to Northampton. Was it? I mean, it's probably, you're absolutely right. Having an older brother, you just want to get out of that, don't you really? And, and not be in that shadow type thing. Exactly. Yeah. Everyone said I was in his shadow and I couldn't drive. So he'd have to drive me into work and drive me back and it would have just been hellish so I just Northampton obviously offered me a contract and I thought it was a good decision obviously I've not really looked back since so pretty happy with that decision and listen we are um, forever you know talking to clubs and directors of rugby there's obviously been a bit of a shift you've worked under Chris Boyd who we all think is just one of the best people in rugby he's left his mark on Northampton and obviously then the likes of Phil Dowson, you know, and Sam Vesti and the team there. I mean, we try and make a little bit more of it than sometimes there is. But from a player's perspective, it, it was fascinating watching you guys score your winning try yesterday. The whole coaching group were going bananas, apart from Dowson, who was just sort of, you know, what's the what's the problem? Not even a, a flicker of emotion. It, it's, what's changed, do you think, going from uh, Chris Boyd to, to Phil at the top? I actually saw that clip. Such a weird clip, isn't it? All the coaches going mad and Dowson's just pretty cool, calm and collected. He wasn't feeling well, though, yesterday, Alex, was he? You told me right? pretty much. Did, yeah, he was like, well, me I'm not feeling great. Really All right. right. Um, no, just the changes. Obviously, Boydy was very calm, like very wise lad and kind of, yeah, like to keep like a lid on things. But Dalson's very emotional, very good talker. So in that sense, they're actually quite different. And that's why I was quite surprised of Dalson not jumping up from his chair when we obviously won. But they're both very similar. They're both very good knowledge of the game and I think it helps with Vesti underneath them, who's a, an awesome attack coach. And I think that's why our attack goes so well at times. And they bounce off each other a lot of the time. So to have them both been awesome, I think, for us. Big news, though, last week, um, Dan Bigger leaving you at the end of the season. Our favourite, favourite for player. I actually do love Dan Bigger. Not just because he's Welsh. I just think he's great. <laughs> um, but what, what have you kind of learned, I suppose, from playing alongside him? A lot, really. I mean, a lot of people think he's just whiny and just doesn't stop chirping, but he's actually a really good lad off the pitch. Always comes for coffees with the lads. And on the pitch, he's just a hell of a leader. Doesn't stop talking. I mean, for me, to have someone like that outside me, it just makes my job so easy. He's, he's always talking. He's always telling me what he wants. Sometimes it gives me a good rollicking if I, if I don't get it right. But sometimes that's what you need, especially when I was younger. Yeah, so he's been awesome. It's a shame to see him go, but obviously I don't think we can afford him. So, uh, yeah, he'll be off elsewhere. Sign of the times, that guy's though, isn't it? Unfortunately. Exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, listen, you were living in a house with, I don't know if this is still the case actually, but you were living in a house with George Furban, weren't you? And, and David Ribbons over lockdown, you still there? You still living with them now? No, finally moved out. They said I was with Daddy Dave for way too long. I was going to be there for six months, uh, but ended up being three years and he just looked after me. But <laughs> yeah, during lockdown, Ferbs had a place, but he didn't want to live there by himself. So he came back and yeah, we did all sorts of things, garden cricket and had a lot of arguments. TikTok. TikToks. We get a lot of stick for still, um, but we had to do it. The media team said we had to do it. So um, They said you had to. We've got a clip of that. Okay. We must have a clip of that, haven't we? I hope not. We've all seen it. <laughs> I was watching it and I was like, I can't work out if they're really good dancers or not. Yeah, <laughs> like, no. I was trying no, <laughs> just like robots. Just so bad. <laughs> I thought it might have been a thing. No, that was he didn't. He didn't persuade you to invest in any facial hair then while you were living together. No, no I can't. It's too crap, so I couldn't try and do that. <laughs> too wispy. Yeah, exactly. Alex, listen, we'll, uh, we'll we'll move it back onto the rugby. We're talking England. Um, you made your international debut against Tonga. You scored a try, so that's that's a pretty good way to announce your arrival. Obviously, you didn't go to Australia. It's the scrum half position, and it's you know. You, 
it's just been for us viewers it keeps going one way then the other you know there's Rafi Quirks in the in the mix then yourself Danny Kerr comes out of you know old people's home back into the mix as well and uh, you know it just the position just keeps changing does the England coach actually talk to each and every one of you and you know individually and say look you're not in at the minute this is what you need to do to get in or how does it work because clearly your aspirations have got to be to try and be that late run into the squad and into the World Cup squad I guess I think so yeah I think that's everyone's goal and like I said, Eddie does speak to us all, I think. I think every player's got a, got something to work on or something to get better at. For me, it's that consistency and, and little things that I can get better. But like you said, the competition is pretty rife at Scrum Half at the moment. There's, there's so many good players across the board. I think every club has got a very good Scrum Half. So it's one of them you can't really look at, look too far ahead. You never know what's going to happen with injuries or, or form or whatnot. So I think for me, it's just putting my head down and, and doing a job at Northampton and then England will look after itself. Yeah, well, you're certainly doing that all right. But... Uh... I think we're going to we're going to part the questions for a little while, Sar, aren't we? And uh, maybe dig into some of the rugby. Yeah, shall we? The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. We start then with Friday night. Um, the first of two West Country derbies for Exeter Chiefs arrive at Ashton Gate um, and they took on Bristol Bears, of course. Now, both teams, they were stinging a little bit from defeat to the weekend before. Lawrence, you and I were down there. It was initially a really strong start wasn't it from the Bears but it, did the game kind of get away from them or turn a little bit with, with Ellis Genji's yellow card I think it was a bit of a reality check for Pat Lamb and his team I think that you know they were unbeaten in the first three matches admittedly I think they played Bath London Irish and Wasps who if you've got aspirations of being at the top of the league are probably teams that you have to think you're going to beat disappointed against Newcastle you can't get away from that and I, I don't know whether it was a mixture of the journey or just just a bad day sometimes you have bad days where you don't turn up as a group collectively and you've got to dust yourself down. But I think this particular performance will hurt because it's very clear that without Ellis Genge, and he tried everything, sometimes tried a bit too hard, and without uh, Lua Tua, their captain, they really are struggling in terms of leadership and the group. I thought that, as you said, their best moment came in that first few minutes when they scored their try. And after that, they actually went downhill and conversely, Exeter went up. And I just think you're, you're looking at two different teams, really. I thought everything Exeter did was powerful, strong, collective. They looked like they're getting themselves back to the sort of Chiefs that used to play maybe a couple of seasons ago. Um, they look very, very strong. And I think uh, for them, it'll be probably a performance that Ali Hefer will be very proud of because there's been so many teams, Wasp for an example yesterday, uh, maybe Northampton have done it on a couple of occasions where you go out to a really big lead early on in a match and you think you're done and dusted and you, you kind of the points are in the bag and then these teams somehow seem to reel you in and you know that happened to Exeter twice against Leicester and against Harlequins and they nearly lost the game and I think the difference was that they really really imposed themselves in that game and then they just hit the accelerator so yeah Bristol worrying times I think Pat Lamb's got to get back on the training pitch and, and just get them feeling confident again not quite sure what it is. Yeah, Alex, lot was saying there about, you know, um, in the premiership at the moment, teams go off to a big start and then other teams catch up with them and beat them at the end. It's a crazy place. It seems to be a crazy place to play at the moment. Do you, as players, feel like it, it's different to seasons gone by? Yeah, it has been different. I think a big thing as well is the amount of yellow cards, red cards and HIAs that are actually going on at the moment. I think that swings games a lot of times. It's like you'd be ahead and obviously a red card, yellow card, and that would change the game. Um, obviously nowadays, I think it's great looking after people's heads and, and concussions, but it's changing the game in a way. I think we saw some stat the other day, 25% of games are, are decided if there's been a yellow or red card for the opposition side. So it's one of the things that nowadays we're doing a lot of game scenario things and training of, oh, we've got a red card and the yellow card in the forwards what are we going to do how are we going to deal with that so I think that's one big reason why games um, change so much I mean look at our game Umaga getting a red card and that kind of swings the momentum to our side so there's a lot of things that clubs have got to get right nowadays and I think it's good for rugby though as well it's making it a bit more entertaining Alex can I just ask that question then on that basis there's a lot I mean apart from the set piece which I think is always going to be an important part of the game scrum line out restart is a lot of the training based around sort of quite chaotic situations because it, when you watch the game now it's about attack counter attack it's about turnover ball you know there's, there's so much that happens in quite a chaotic situation and you have to kind of rehearse and, and practice that in training don't you exactly yeah we don't just do drills nowadays we try and make it game scenario so if they just chuck a ball in or they, they sometimes we have a scoreboard on the side of the pitch with two minutes left and it's like our oh, 14 10 down you've got two minutes against wind 
try and play your way out of it. That'd so be easy for Saints, it's four points down. Well, what <laughs> yeah. about 24 points down? <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, it's just one of them things that the game's changing. You've got to adapt and, and get used to it. And um, yeah, it's one of them that teams are getting better at. And like I said, it's making it more entertaining, isn't it? Okay, let's move on then. Uh, Steve, let's turn to Saturday's game. Leicester's defeat at home to Sale. We were like 16-12 down at half time, I think. And they came back firing all cinders, not only taking the game, but what was the final score? 26 points, wasn't it? Denying Leicester any further points in that second half. Like you predicted a Sale win. <laughs> On last yes. week's podcast. Yeah. Did can, you make we, it again? can we play last week's podcast, Lol? <laughs> where you said I was talking nonsense that Leicester would lose at home. No, so to be fair, I mean, at Leicester changes again. I mean, we'll get that team, that starting 15 that we want to see eventually. But um, we've spoken a lot about uh, attack and excitement in pot so far from Premiership that we've seen. But I think defence is key and will always be key when you're going to win titles and what have you. And I mean, Sale have now conceded the fewest number of points in the Premiership, 78 in four games. Gloucester are next, 79, and they've played a game less. So clearly that's going to have a big part to play going forward. But I think they've got all the right ingredients at the moment, Sale. You've got Manu Tuolangi, who's fit, who's charging around, ball carrying, big hits um, all over the place, looking like he's enjoying the game again. Tom Curry leading from the front. And as we've said, Rafi Kirk coming off the bench here, there, every, I can't swear, can I, everywhere, uh, literally on the, on the pitch. I mean, scoring a try, setting up a try, stopping a try. I mean, you can't ask for more than that, really. So I think uh, at the moment, sail are flying. My one concern, maybe, Autumn International's on the horizon. When players start disappearing, will they be able to keep that momentum going? But no, looking all, all good at the moment. Right, uh, second West Country Derby of the weekend came in the form of Bath Gloucester at the Rec. Sunny Saturday afternoon, another defeat for Bath. But Lawrence uh, and Steve and Alex, I guess it was a good second half performance for them. But again, they just, I don't know, they just leave themselves too much to do in that second 40, don't they? I didn't realise this, but Bath have won nearly every second half they've played in. But unfortunately, they just give themselves a massive mountain to climb. I think Van Graham, the coach, has got a bit of a job on his hands. It says a lot about a team in terms of where they are at the minute when Ollie Lawrence goes in there and he's only had two training sessions and he's their best player on the pitch. So admittedly, they've got a lot of injury problems and I'm not going to slam them because, you know, they've got their caps in. Charlie Yules is out. Sam Underhill. They've got long term, you know, issues, which all clubs have. But I think culturally and in terms of their attitude, they need to step up massively. We've all been in teams that lose, but, you know, there's things that we all share in common and it's your heart and your ability to get off the floor and just work hard. And uh, I think they're being outworked in games particularly in the, in the in the beginning of games and that for me is inexcusable as a rugby player doesn't matter what what club you, you belong to so I think that there are things that will take longer to fix at Bath but equally there's things that you can fix very very quickly and I would only be picking players who actually want to want to actually get themselves off the floor and actually get back in the game very quickly is defense a cultural thing is it is it like do you know what I'm trying to say? Is it does a culture need to change or well, Alex will be able to give us an insight into how they are, but if players are connected off the field and they're spending time together and they like each other and they're they're looking after each other in their everyday lives, then that's what you tend to take on the field as well. And in actual fact, if you're really close off the field, then you, you really look after each other and you really go that extra bit on the field as well. And that takes time to build, but it needs buy-in from all the players. And Alex was saying, you know, Dan Bigger, he, you know, he comes and joins the boys. You know, yes, you've got a family work-life balance, but equally you've got to be prepared to enjoy each other's company on and off the field. I think everyone's got their defensive systems, haven't they? But obviously if you're closer off the field, you're willing to work for the player next to you a bit more. And at the end of the day, defence is just energy and work rate. Like everyone's got different systems and how to do this, but it's it's how willing you're you're willing to work and and get off the line and hit something. So yeah, so I think that's obviously where Bath may be struggling at the moment. It is kind of a cultural thing, obviously. If you if you're willing to to play with the boys on that field, you're more likely to get everything out of them. So um, that's one thing you need to look at. Alex, how hard is it to keep practicing your defence now with the directives being that there should be less contact, particularly in training? I mean, is it something that you can work on without? Tackling? I think so, yeah. Obviously, training's changed a bit. We do a lot of technical stuff now, so getting in the right positions, 
especially in the breakdown, we, we go through the movements, but don't actually do the collisions, which is good. But sometimes, obviously, we still do 15 to, to 30 minutes of contact a week just because you still need to get that repetition into you. But it, it is one thing that's changed a bit, and I think you'll probably adapt even more in the next couple of years. Okay, so Alex, you guys paid a visit. Northampton paid a visit to us at the CVS Arena. And like so many games already this season, as we've spoken about, we witnessed another thrilling ending to the match. Um, you guys were 36-35 down, so point in it. 78 minutes so at that stage what's been said is it oh okay lads like what do we do or have you got a plan what you're going to do or do you just play in front of you what's the crack your game plan changes a bit obviously we need to to play a bit more possession based rugby and we knew we were going to play from deep but apart from that nothing really changes we were struggling at the breakdown a lot I mean Jack Willis was was all over our ball he was unbelievable so we spoke about the breakdown obviously look after that department and we know if we look after the ball and play phases we'll we'll break them down and, and we ended up doing that yeah I think we were what, eight points down with two minutes to go and then obviously managed to get two tries in two minutes so yeah finally stuck at the end and yeah got the result yeah like, and the thing is a win's a win like Lawrence was saying isn't it you know like everything wasn't perfect for you yesterday but you'll take those points it kind of felt like you guys almost needed I know we're only five games into the season so it's almost ridiculous to be saying this but it felt like you guys needed that at the weekend because you, you were starting to fall off the pace a little bit in terms of points is that fair? I think yeah I think so if we didn't win that game I think we would have been yeah behind the leading pack and you always need to be in that top four top six going through the season and we don't want to be chasing it because as soon as you're chasing it the confidence dips a bit and different things change and you may want to change game plans because you're losing games which you should never do so yeah massive for the boys and it'll give us some confidence this week going into next I think we need to change the strap line for Sunday's games don't we to any given Sunday one team will win as time expires it's just <laughs> yeah. madness isn't it every Sunday it's so good yeah. yeah and it's like for me I was presenting yesterday and you kind of start thinking about your questions for post-match I don't know how many games this season already I'm like okay well there's no point that, that piece of paper is gone with like 30, 30 seconds left of the game so it's uh, but it's great it's great to watch it's great for the fans obviously um, now Lawrence I know you've received some criticism for some of your comments about uh, whether Wasps should also be relegated if they go into administration um, and that whole situation do you want to clarify your thoughts on that Yes, I would like to clarify uh, my comments that I made yesterday on TV um, and hopefully I put them right later on on the Rugby Tonight show. But just for clarity purposes, um, obviously on Worcester being relegated, you know, I believe that they can appeal relegation should they come out of administration under different ownership. It's all quite hypothetical with Wasps uh, because up until now, they're actually not in uh, administration at the moment. And I don't think it's uh, fair that one club should be relegated and one shouldn't. That's not what I was actually saying. And if people took that as what I was saying, then um, that's the reason for my clarification. I was saying that we need to understand that there has been a global pandemic over the last three years and that we need to understand that if rugby is a truly a family, then families tend to stick together, don't they? So I don't agree with what's happened to Worcester. Uh, I think it's a heartbreaking situation. They've been left out there on a limb and I think rugby needs to have a real good look at itself. Um, the game of professional rugby, in my opinion, is a very small part of the overall game of rugby in this country, including grassroots. Everyone uh, has made huge investments as clubs into that professional end of the game. And I think it's important that the right decisions are made to ensure that the future of the professional end of the game remains intact. So hopefully that clarifies the comments. As I said, I apologise if those comments were taken out of context. It certainly wasn't my case to, to put that message across. Yeah, I feel like we could talk about this subject, obviously, for the, the next half an hour. But um, OK, so let's move on then. Newcastle Saracens, unfortunately, for Dave Alder's men, they couldn't quite pull off um, a repeat performance from the weekend before against Bristol. And Saris took the win, 34 points uh, to the Falcons, 14. Steve, Newcastle, I mean, they haven't beaten Saracens since 2009, I think. So it was always going to be a tough one for them, this. No, it's uh, 21 games now, which is an incredible run. But um, again, I know I keep going on about defence, but even Joe Shaw mentioned it after the game, that that was what he was most impressed with by Saracens in their first half performance was the shutout, was not conceding any points. But another superb display by Saracens and calling out with Lawrence last week, he picked up on Elliot Daly's form. He had a hand in all five tries that they scored. Superb. The one blot. Mako's red cards, but obviously he's now probably going to get a ban, which I would imagine would be six weeks, probably ruling him out of the first two 
Autumn Internationals. He clearly got that one wrong. Disappointing that he did that, but clearly he uh, he, he realised that it was uh, the wrong thing to have done and he apologised straight away. OK, so we've done the games. Should we start with the most outstanding player of the weekend? Outstanding. Supported by Fuller's London Pride. Lawrence, who's yours this week? Well, I was thinking about Rafi Quirk, but I thought, uh, as I've got Alex Mitchell on here, I didn't think it was appropriate for me to name him as the outstanding player. <laughs> you be, really can, you can. That would be a bit cruel, <laughs> even though they did steal the points from us yesterday. So uh, I think for me, there was a couple of wingers that played very well for Exeter. Um, in fact, the whole Exeter team played very well. But Ollie Woodburn, I think for me, has been a really, well, he's been a great player for, for a number of years now, very consistent player, hasn't obviously taken that step up to international rugby, but they look really fit they look really hungry and he epitomizes that I think he the way that he scored those two tries for any young winger watching uh, particularly the first one I thought it was outstanding so just that for that finish alone uh, he's my uh, outstanding player of the week Ollie Woodburn okay Alex you've been on great form this season you can't pick yourself this week though so who are you going to go for <laughs> I think obviously a few boys were, were awesome this week. Jack Willis is up there. He made our breakdown a nightmare. And I, th- I thought he was class. Rafi looked really sharp, but from watching the, the Saracens highlights, I thought Elliot Daly, I think I thought he was awesome last week. And I think he's just everywhere at the moment, isn't he? So an uh, outstanding player would be Elliot Daly. Yeah. Steve? I'm going to go defence again, unsurprisingly. But uh, Ruin Ackerman on uh, Saturday was superb. Um, 22 tackles. Uh, ultimately, he was the one who ended those 25 phases of Bath play right at the end by stealing the ball I just thought he was superb and absolutely fantastic and he's my outstanding player of the week I'm just going to go Ollie Lawrence in a losing side in that West Country derby I just feel like after all the Worcester have been through to put you know, showing in like that on a debut for a new club was good. Yeah, so that's mine for what it's worth, right? Uh, okay, uh, next again, see round six of the league. So let's take a look at the fixture list then. Uh, we'll be like short and sharp on, on these gents. Friday night, it's Sale London Irish. So Steve, who are we going for there? Sale. <laughs> I'm going to be that sharp. You can give me yeah, no, that's sharp. No, I think, I think playing at home, London Irish, still perennial entertainers, but just can't defend. So yeah, it's got to be Sale. You had a pound for every time you said defend or defence on the podcast this week. No, I, I've made Rich this defence. It, it started at the beginning, didn't it? Because we built on defence at under 12s. If you win, if you defend, <laughs> oh, you're Are you still win. banging no. on about that win? Still banging on about that win. <laughs> OK. Um, Saturday games. Um, Alex Wasps travelled to Sandy Park to face Exeter. I mean, they looked very good on Friday night. How are you seeing this one going? I think, yeah, Exeter is obviously a really tough place to go. So I've got to put Exeter down for that one, especially after their performance against Bristol. Lol. West Country battle again at King's Home. Um, Gloucester host Bristol. It's hard, isn't it? Gloucester have had a bit of a fragmented start to the season. They, they obviously had the Worcester game cancelled and then they had a bye week early on. So they haven't really got going yet, but they are a good side. They're very, you know, they look formidable. They seem to be a first half team at the minute and then they, they're sort of dropping off a little bit second half. But Bristol, my word, they would have had the hairdryer treatment all week in training. And to be honest, that can go one of two ways. Uh, if you're trying to put things right, I'm not sure King's Own is the place to go and do it. There was five away wins last weekend in the Premiership, which is unheard of. But I do see this one uh, going with the home team. Northampton, Newcastle, Steve. Uh, Northampton, Alex Mitchell, hat trick. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that one? No chance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Alex, tabletop for Saris. Uh, they welcome Bath. I mean, if you were Bath heading there this weekend, what would your mindset be? It's a tough one, right? Yeah, it is tough. Obviously, we said about their defence, and and obviously they can they can live off their second half performances. So try and galvanise around that and, and try to put performance in. But obviously that's going to be a tough old way, um, a place to go, sorry. So yeah, I'll probably go savage for that one. Okay, lol. Um, rounding things off then on Sunday, Quinn's Leicester going to be at the Stoop. Who do you think is coming away from that one? Well, do you know what? It just made me think that Leicester, when you look at their fixture list, they've had some really tough fixtures. I mean, this is like round six, isn't it? And they had Exeter away first game. They're now playing Quinn's away. They played Sale at home. They played Saracens away. So all of those fixtures will reverse at the end of the season. So to be honest, I was when I was playing, all I looked at was the running at the end of the season. What were the last six fixtures? Because you'd like to think you're there or thereabouts in the playoffs and that's where you really start to push the pedal. So I think Leicester will have a hard work against Harlequins. It's very hard to beat Quins at the stoop at the minute. I think they're in a, a nice little groove. But, you know, all of those fixtures for Leicester Tigers will reverse. So if they can hang in there, 
I think they've got a great run in to the end of the season. Okay, so we're pleased to announce actually that we've got our first live podcast recording of the season uh, following that match. So if you're at the game, be sure to stick around, join the fun later. Uh, we've got some great guests and we'll be announcing who those guests are during the week. So keep an eye on uh, on social media for those. You don't want to miss it. Okay, so time to put our guests back under the spotlight now. Alex, Lawrence loves this part of the show. So brace yourself, strap yourself in. Tackled. Supported by Fuller's London Pride. Alex, it's called Tackled. Uh, it's quick fire questions so that all of our listeners can get to know you a bit better. So uh, uh, what's your full name? Alexander Arthur David Mitchell, far too posh. That is very posh. I know, I'm not posh either, so I don't know why I would name that. <laughs> say, did you say Alex Arthur Daly Mitchell, did you? <laughs> no, no, I wish. <laughs> what's your f- favourite takeaway? Indian. Uh, who's your celebrity crush? Kim Kardashian, maybe. Last film you watched? The Fighter. Oh, I like it. And what did you have for breakfast today? I had a full English. Ah, yeah. Game. yeah <laughs> some energy. Uh, nickname? Uh, just Mitch. Best advice that you've ever been given? I've had a few. A weird one, but always have a ball in your hands, regardless. <laughs> Who is the most famous person in your phone book or your phone list? Eddie Jones? I said, uh, <laughs> don't really know. Uh, James Haskell, maybe. I don't know. Oh, in, <laughs> no, in, his own, in, in his own head, yes. Uh, <laughs> who would play you in the film about your life? Steve Carell, I think. Good choice. Who's the funniest person you know? Paul Hill, but not. he's like funny to laugh at. He's not actually funny. <laughs> he's, he's a weirdo. <laughs> That's basically who do you take the mickey out of the most in your yeah, team? Yeah. Are you a dog or cat man? I, I used to have a cat growing up, so I like cats, but dog man. Okay. And... Um, your favourite karaoke song? What do they make you sing on the bus? Well, for my debut, I just sang Country Roads, uh, but my karaoke song for just tequila, simple. Beautiful. Um, favourite TV show at the moment? Uh, Game of Thrones. Which superhero would you most like to be? Probably Batman. I'd like to be Bruce Wayne. Just seems like a cool guy. Because <laughs> he's um, got loads of cash. He's got loads of cash as well. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the best rugby player in your mind of all time? Who's the guy that you really looked up to growing up as a kid or you, you really admire now or, or then? I think growing up and, and throughout the World Cup, the 2015 World Cup, Dan Carter. I think he's been awesome. Yeah, they got him involved in the, uh, in the Women's World Cup, now, haven't they, with the New Zealand team? Uh, doing a bit of coaching. Um, and for you personally, what's your most memorable rugby moment to date so far? Obviously, England debut was obviously up there in front of my family and, and 80,000. But the I don't know, the best moment was England 16s and I scored last couple of minutes and we beat uh, Wales. So, yeah, that was probably my, my best moment. I don't know why, it just sticks deep in my memory. See, Sarah, it's not just me. They no, like clearly it's not just you. I was just about to say that. Great stuff. Listen, thank you for sharing those insights. We really appreciate that. Good luck for your match against Newcastle. No pressure. It's just a hat-trick we've uh, we predicted. <laughs> uh, hopefully, uh, I think I speak on behalf of everyone on this pod and certainly a lot of England rugby fans out there that we hope to see you run out in an England shirt in the not-too-distant future. So uh, thanks for being our guest. Thanks, Lawrence. Cheers, guys. That's all for this episode of the Rugby Podcast supported by Fuller's London Pride. Our thanks again goes to Alex Mitchell. Thanks, Alex. Great to see you. And to Steve Cording too, of course. And you too, Lawrence. Well, and thanks to Sarah as well. Don't forget, you can watch the full extended video podcast of today's episode at londonpridebeer.co.uk. Yeah, make sure, guys, you're following on your favourite podcast platform so that you don't miss any future episodes. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, Supported by Fuller's London Pride. Official beer of Premiership Rugby. Support with pride.